This along with aquaculture is one of the questions of our future, isn't it? It's a topic that's gaining momentum. And I find it's a, a natural path for most people wanting so badly to hang on to the false sense of needing versus simply wanting to eat animal products. It's a path of least resistance, let's face it. So let's look at a couple different ways to answer this question. And there you have it, that's, that's one way to answer it. I mean, he thinks so, and so do many others. My thought, though, is that we need to be fully aware of the consequences of our food choices, not partially aware. And we need to understand what we're doing to all aspects of global depletion. We need to know the urgency of the problem and the timelines we're on. This is not a go meatless on Monday type of problem or when we get around to it type of problem. So I have another way to answer this grass-fed question. If I gave each one of you one acre of land to grow your own food, any food you want, what would you grow? What, what should you grow? Well, at all my other college and university lectures, the students know what they want to grow. <laughs> I, I don't know what this is yet, but that's what they tell me they want to grow. <laughs> and there's a way they could grow that and make, make it work. <laughs> On this one acre, you could try to raise one grass-fed cow, thinking it's fully sustainable, just like that New York Times multiple-time best-selling author is telling everyone. But in most areas of the world, one acre is not enough. You're going to need 5, 10, 15. I've seen areas that need 50 acres for one cow. So you could use your one acre for grass-fed livestock, and you'd end up with about 50 to 100 pounds of a type of food that's then implicated in numerous disease states after you eat it. And along the way, you've produced 6 to 7 tons of methane and carbon dioxide, and you've used 1 to 2 million gallons of water for that cow and feed for the cow while continuing the loss of biodiversity. Or instead, if you used your acre of land to grow a vegetable, fruit, grain combination, you've produced 20 to 60,000 pounds of food that's infinitely healthier for you to eat and for our planet to grow. And when looking at global growing applications, I mean, how cool is this? Certain plants like kale will, will actually continue to grow through extremes of temperatures from minus five degrees here in my, in my backyard <laughs> over the winter through 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And after you pick the leaves to eat of something like kale, after you pick the leaves, does anybody know what happens? New ones grow back. <laughs> yeah, they regenerate. I bet your cow can't do that. <laughs> it's astounding what you can produce on that one acre over the period of time it would take to raise your one grass-fed cow. It's quite an amazing difference, isn't it? Now imagine extrapolating that model out in terms of global use of our resources and now answer that question about how sustainable raising grass-fed livestock really is. That's what I'm asking here, before I was hastily escorted off the farm. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't. And for those who still think that eating any animal is sustainable, it's time to introduce and understand and appreciate this concept, optimal or optimal relative sustainability. That'll work. How sustainable is it to raise and eat any animal product in a relative sense as compared to plant-based foods? How can we best use our dwindling natural resources? What foods will have the very least effect on climate change? Which foods best promote our own human health? And which are the most compassionate? All wrapped up into one package. Well, how nice is that? This is the way we need to start viewing things in a relative sense as to then how to achieve optimal sustainability.